Hi, and welcome to the Memory Matters virtual talk series sponsored by the Johns Hopkins Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. My name is Dr. Megan Morris, and I am a neuropathologist with the Johns Hopkins ADRC. And I'll be talking to you today about the importance of brain donation for Alzheimer's disease and related disorders research. So just an overview of what we're going to be talking about. Really the most important point in most of this talk is going to focus on why is brain donation important for the development of improved treatments for older people. Um, we'll talk a little bit about what we've learned from donated brain tissue and what advances do we still need to make and really why it's important to link the findings in donated brain tissue to how someone's been functioning in daily life and how that link actually advances our understanding of the disease and the development of therapies. And finally, we'll get into some frequently asked questions about brain donation. So why is brain donation important for finding improved treatments for older people? Well, it turns out we've learned a lot of things about brain donation and aging with brain diseases. And it turns out that there's an increased risk of multiple diseases occurring with aging in both the body and the brain. So it's common knowledge that with aging, the risk increases for diabetes, for arthritis, for heart disease, and many more diseases. But they're not mutually exclusive, and an individual who gets arthritis with aging might also have heart disease, for example. And that's true in the brain as well. So with aging in the brain, it increases your risk for Alzheimer's disease, Lewy body disease, vascular disease, and more. But an individual with Alzheimer's disease might also have Lewy body disease, for example. And it turns out in fact, most older individuals have multiple pathologies in their brain, particularly if they have dementia. And so in an individual without dementia, there's a lower occurrence of mixed pathologies or more than one disease pathology in the brain. And many individuals have no pathology at all. But in individuals with dementia, the increased risk of mixed pathologies or mixed diseases in the brain actually increases in this study between 40 and 50%. And actually other studies have found it to be much more common even than that. And so on the left, you'll see individuals who had normal cognition and many of those had some sort of pathology in the brain, although it was not enough to affect their thinking and memory. And the increased risk of mixed pathologies or the increased incidence of mixed pathologies gets higher in individuals with MCI or mild cognitive impairment and individuals with dementia that was diagnosed as probable Alzheimer's disease, more than three quarters of those individuals in the study actually had mixed diseases in the brain. And these diseases can vary. So in individuals who had probable Alzheimer's disease in life, most of them had Alzheimer's disease pathology, but many of them also had vascular disease, as shown in red, or accumulation of other abnormal proteins in the brain, like TDP or Lewy bodies, as shown in green. And actually a small subset of individuals who had dementia that mimicked Alzheimer's disease actually had mixed pathologies that were not Alzheimer's pathology in the brain, including vascular disease, TDP, and Lewy body disease. And it turns out, therefore, that mixed diseases are very common in the brain. They can actually mimic a, a clinical picture of Alzheimer's disease and the pathology underlying dementia is much more, com much more complex than we've previously given it credit for. So what have we learned about these diseases from donated brain tissue? And I'll focus first on Alzheimer's disease and then move into other related dementias. So we all know that diseases affecting the brain can cause changes in how someone thinks on a daily basis. And it's very common for diseases affecting the brain to cause memory changes, changes in thinking, changes in problem solving. You can actually sometimes get problems with walking and movement. Emotional and behavioral changes are relatively common. And individuals with brain diseases often develop difficulty managing their daily activities on their own. And as the disease progresses, individuals that get to dementia are unable to maintain their independent function in daily life. And what you see in the brain, and you can see an Alzheimer's disease brain on the right compared to an individual who had normal aging on the left, is that there's a lot more space in and around the brain in Alzheimer's disease, which is caused by loss or atrophy of the brain itself due to loss of the connections between brain cells and loss of brain cells in the disease. Now, Alzheimer's disease is very common. It's actually the most common cause of dementia with about six and a half million Americans living with Alzheimer's disease in the United States today. 
And the memory loss and dementia is often caused in these diseases by the accumulation of abnormal proteins in the brain. So for Alzheimer's disease, the two proteins that accumulate are tau and amyloid beta. And I'm showing you microscopic images of both of them on the, on the top right. Tau, you can see in dark brown, filling out the brain cells in this sort of triangular shape, whereas amyloid beta is sort of a dark circular disruption in the brain outside of brain cells. And both tau and amyloid beta accumulate to cause Alzheimer's disease. But there are other brain diseases that are related that are caused by the accumulation of other proteins. And so, for example, synuclein, shown in sort of the dark brown, is shown accumulating in a circular aggregate in that brain cell. And this is the underlying protein that causes Lewy body dementia. TDP43 also shows a relatively circular accumulation in brain cells, also shown in dark brown. And TDP43 can accumulate in a number of different brain diseases. So what have we learned about these diseases so far? Well, I've shown you that we know from the vast majority of cases, what are the abnormal proteins that accumulate in the brain? Uh, we also know typically how most of these proteins spread through the brain and how that relates to our decline in cognition. So I'm showing you again, Alzheimer's disease proteins. And on the top, you see the spread of amyloid beta, which in the beginning is fairly widely distributed in the cortex in the brain. And as the disease progresses, it accumulates, which is shown as the color gets darker, and then it spreads to the deeper brain structures. Tau actually has a very different pattern of spread through the brain, where it starts in very specific areas in the brain and then spreads through the brain as the disease progresses. And we know that in Alzheimer's disease, typically there are high levels of A-beta before tau really starts spreading much through the brain, and that the cognitive decline that we see in Alzheimer's disease is typically associated with the spread of tau through the brain. Now, we've learned a lot about proteins and pathologies, but I'll highlight next a little bit about what other things we can learn from donated brain tissue and what the benefits are. So for an individual and their family uh, that decides on brain donation, the donated brain tissue can be used to confirm the clinical diagnosis. So if someone is diagnosed with probable Alzheimer's disease during life, we can confirm that Alzheimer's disease changes are present in the brain. We can also identify if more than one disease was present in the brain, which as we've discussed is really common, both in individuals with dementia and in individuals without cognitive impairment. And what we'll focus on a little bit next are the other things that can happen with donated brain tissue. So donated brain tissue is actually used to accelerate new biomarker development. And we do that by combining information from the clinical symptoms, laboratory samples that were donated during life, any imaging that was done during life, with the knowledge of what brain diseases are present in the brain. And we can actually combine all of this information to develop new biomarkers for testing of living patients. We also provide tissue to scientists to accelerate the understanding of these diseases, how they operate, and to help accelerate the discovery of new treatments for these diseases. So, donated brain tissue is critical to developing new testing and treatments for these diseases. And actually, for tau and amyloid beta, we have the most advanced biomarkers so far in development. Some of these have actually made it into clinical use. Other ones are still more on the research side. And scientists have developed tests for amyloid and tau in spinal fluid. They've developed imaging tests for these two proteins and also blood tests for these. And here's one example from the imaging literature of the tests that have been developed in conjunction with donated brain tissue, some of which are in clinical use. And so, for example, the structural MRI and the amyloid PET uh, were developed in conjunction with donated brain tissue and are approved for clinical use at this point. Whereas others, such as, for example, synaptic density, which are the connections between brain cells that are lost in Alzheimer's disease, are really much more on the research side at this point. We also have advanced uh, clinical trials targeting amyloid beta and tau to attempt to treat Alzheimer's disease. So new disease treatments have been developed by studying donated brain tissue. So we've come pretty far. We know a lot about what the proteins are and how they spread through the brain. 
We have now developed biomarkers for some of these proteins, laboratory tests, and we have therapeutic options that are in development targeting amyloid and tau. So what do we still need to do? Well, it turns out we've still got a lot to learn. So on the basic side, we need to understand what changes in pathologies in the brain are associated with normal aging. So some of the initial graphs that I showed you actually showed that there's a relatively high proportion of people who don't have dementia, but do have either a single pathology or mixed pathologies in the brain. So we still have a lot of work to do to understand what the pathologies are that develop with normal aging and when they tip over into disease and cognitive impairment. Uh, we still need to understand what factors increase the risk for multiple diseases occurring in the brain of the same person. Why is it that one individual will have two or three brain diseases and dementia, whereas another individual will have a pure Alzheimer's disease pathology in the brain? We also have a lot to learn about how these diseases interact with each other to cause dementia. And so we've talked a lot about tau and amyloid beta, which are our main two proteins that accumulate in Alzheimer's disease. And we've learned quite a bit about how tau and amyloid beta interact. There have also been studies on tau and synuclein but there's a lot left to learn about the remaining interactions of common diseases that occur together in the brain to cause dementia, either on a molecular level, which is where a lot of studies have been, or on a brain circuit level and how these diseases interact to cause dementia. And finally, we have a lot more biomarker development to do. So while we have fairly advanced biomarker development for tau and amyloid beta, we still have a lot of work to do to develop good biomarkers for synuclein and for TDP43, which commonly co-occur with Alzheimer's disease pathology. And we need new ways to treat or prevent dementia. So we have some treatments that are in fairly advanced clinical testing for Alzheimer's disease, but we also need other ways that we're able to treat patients with other types of dementia or patients who have mixed pathologies. Now, a brief note on why it is critically important to link findings in brain tissue with how someone functions in daily life. So it turns out that looking at the brain after death is like looking at a photograph of a single point in time. We can look and determine what diseases are present. We can tell how far the diseases have gotten, but we have very limited information to understand how this disease affected the person during life. And in fact, People who get involved in clinical research really help us better understand how the diseases that are present in the brain can affect living people. So here, for example, is an individual who would enroll in a clinical research study, and at every visit, they have cognitive testing. And at one visit, maybe they give a blood sample. At another visit, maybe they have an imaging study done. Maybe at another visit, they volunteer to give a spinal fluid sample. And all of this information is combined with knowing what diseases were present in the brain tissue, and we can use that information to help develop new laboratory and imaging tests. So the blood can then be searched for proteins that give us clues as to what the diseases are in the brain of living individuals. And it can also help researchers develop new strategies for treatments. Now, a really great example of what we learn from people by correlating both the living changes in cognition and the brain diseases is given in the case of asymptomatic Alzheimer's disease. So this is a population of individuals that we have learned about through clinical research studies and donated brain tissue. And these individuals in clinical research studies have had repeated cognitive testing and are always normal. They never develop memory problems, they never develop cognitive impairment, but we can see in the donated brain tissue that their brains were full of Alzheimer's disease protein accumulation, full of tau and full of amyloid beta. So somehow these individuals, despite having the Alzheimer's disease proteins in the brain, are actually resistant to developing memory problems and dementia due to these proteins. And so studying these individuals will provide clues as to how some people become resistant to disease. But these are groups of individuals that we would have never known about without having them involved in clinical research studies. So these individuals, without being involved in a clinical research study, we would say there's Alzheimer's disease proteins in the brain, but we would never know that they actually were completely resistant to the effects of those proteins when they were alive. 
So now I'm going into some frequently asked questions about brain donation. When people are interested in brain donation, they commonly have very many questions, and we are also happy to answer those questions as well any studies that they're participating in. But one of the most common ones we get is, is brain donation expensive? And the answer is no. So if it's donated as part of a clinical research study, then the brain donation itself is paid for by the research study. Is brain and clinical research required before brain donation? The answer to that one is typically yes. So most medical institutions will only pay for brain donation if someone has been participating in clinical research while they're alive. You can learn a lot more from knowing both what the diseases are in the brain and how they affected someone during life. So remember, as we talked about, we would never even know that some people are resistant to Alzheimer's disease pathology if those individuals hadn't been participating in a clinical research study. Is brain donation valuable if someone doesn't have memory loss? Absolutely yes. So remember one of our critical uh, knowledge gaps or understanding that we need to have is what normal brain aging looks like in the pathology of the brain. So examining brain tissue from someone we know had no memory problems is actually essential. It's key to providing keys to either early intervention for someone who might develop dementia later or to providing information as to what normal brain aging looks like. Uh, should I talk about brain donation with my family is another common question, and the answer is absolutely yes. It's actually very important to talk to your family if you're considering participating in a brain donation program, because they will be the ones assisting to make the arrangements for brain donation. So if you're thinking about brain donation and you're participating in a clinical study, talk to your family early and let them know your wishes. If I move away, can I still participate in research and donate my brain? And the answer is absolutely yes, but the research study has to know where you've moved to. So if they know where you've moved, then actually you can arrange for a donation to be done locally and sent to the study. So none of the information is lost and brain donation can still happen. And one of the most important frequently asked questions that we get is, can I have an open casket at my funeral if I donate my brain? And the answer is absolutely yes. So nothing done during a brain donation will be visible during an open casket at a funeral, and it will not affect funeral arrangements. So we've covered a lot of information today. In summary, brain donation is very important for developing improved treatments for older individuals, improved laboratory testing and treatments for Alzheimer's disease and related dementias, improved testing for developing uh, for identifying the different types of pathologies that affect memory and thinking abilities in the brain. And brain donation from research participants is particularly valuable because it lets us put together how everyday function and cognitive impairment is linked to the pathologies and brain changes. And as we're understanding with multiple diseases in the brain, that link is ever more complicated. So having the clinical information to link to the underlying brain pathology is absolutely critical for understanding these diseases. For anyone who is interested in brain donation, there are lots of resources out there. This one is a link uh, to a website from the NIA with resources on brain donation. And I wanna give a quick thank you to all of our study participants and donors. Thank you very much for your attention.